So last time we talked about neuromuscular biomechanics and particularly activation of muscle, how we get from a nerve into the muscle to control activation. What I want to do now is do a quick review of the muscle force length and velocity relationships with a little bit more of mathematical specificity. And then we'll talk about muscle architecture. And I want to do this review because the architecture of muscle, that is how the fibers and tendon are laid out within a muscle tendon complex, have a big influence on force length and velocity properties. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll move into some interactions between muscle and tendon and how we mathematically model muscle tendon architecture. So that's the plan. Let's first do a quick review. Remember, muscle has a force length relationship. And that is based at the fundamental unit of contraction of muscle, which is the sarcomere. What I'm plotting here is sarcomere length versus a normalized force, where the maximum active force is 1. That maximum, maximum active force occurs when there's maximum number of overlapping actin and myosins within the muscle. Longer than that, you have fewer actin-myosin overlap and shorter, there's interference of the actin filaments. So we get this force length relationship. And you can imagine that this is going to be different depending on, for a whole muscle, how many sarcomeres you have in series would give you a, a different force length relationship. If you have more sarcomeres in parallel, you'll get more force, and that's going to scale the force length relationship. So we'll look at that in some detail. We conceptualize this in terms of whole muscle with this force length curve. So again, now what I'm plotting here is muscle force versus length for a whole muscle. And defining some terms, FM naught here is the peak isometric force of muscle. It's the maximum active force it generates when it's maximally activated and at a particular length, the optimal muscle fiber length. So I'm plotting muscle fiber length here, and the length at which force peaks is called the optimal muscle fiber length. A couple other things to define. We know that the active curve, shown in green here, is the total curve minus the passive curve. So that'll be important to keep in mind as we move through this lecture and as you do the homework problems associated with the book. So that's the force length relationship. As I mentioned, the maximum isometric force, or sometimes called the peak active isometric force, and optimal muscle fiber lengths are two of the parameters that are really key to a muscle. You can imagine how much force a muscle generates and the length at which it generates it could define a muscle that has a short fat muscle that has a big cross-sectional area, generates large force but over a small distance, or a long thin muscle that has the capacity to generate force over a great range of lengths, but not much peak force. We'll look at that in detail in just a minute. A little bit more tricky is the force-velocity relationship of muscle. So what I'm plotting here is the force a muscle can generate versus its muscle fiber velocity. Also defining a term called the maximum muscle fiber contraction velocity here, Vmax over here. This is the shortening or concentric part of the force length curve. That's when a muscle is doing work, it's generating force and shortening. So the force and displacement are in the same direction. So that's positive work. And I'm also plotting the lengthening direction, eccentric contraction, where the force is this way, but the muscle's being lengthened in this direction. So you can generate very large forces and it's negative work or negative power. Interestingly, when the muscle's lengthening, you can generate more force than when it's isometric. So when a muscle's isometric, it generates one force. When it's shortening, it generates less force, and even less force the faster it shortens, and then can generate more force at lengthening velocities. Finally, Static properties of tendon. Tendon acts like a spring. And what I'm drawing here is the tendon stress versus strain curve. We see a toe region here where it's nonlinear. Then there's a linear region. And then above a certain strain, 
the tendon begins to break. A couple key relationships. One is the stress in tendon that I'm showing here is stress in tendon is the force in tendon divided by the area of tendon. So we're assuming that the stress is uniform across the area of a tendon, so we can just divide the total force in tendon by the area. Tendon strain is the stretch of tendon, so the length of tendon minus its slack length divided by the slack length. So here's the stretch in tendon divided by the tendon slack length. The tendon slack length is the length of tendon at which it just begins to develop force. And you can see that here. So just where force starts to develop is the tendon slack length. So now we have defined tendon stress and tendon strain, and we can use those parameters to begin to make some calculations. The best way we have to make calculations in a muscle tendon complex is this uh, hill type model of muscle and tendon. So just to review that for you, here's the tendon shown in blue here. This is the tendon. Now it's a force length relationship instead of a stress strain relationship. So we'll see how to scale that generic stress strain relationship into a force length relationship for a particular tendon. We see the muscle contractile element here has this active force length curve and the force velocity curve. And the parallel or passive elastic element has this passive property of muscle. So we've seen all that, and now we can take a look at how mu muscle architecture affects these basic properties. Good. We've done our quick review of force length and force velocity relationships. Now we'll go on to talk about muscle architecture.